equally when we are talking about common man adopting to technology doing digital payment you have people sitting with tons of currency notes in their homes people don't like to have corrupt leaders the sabka saath sabka vishwas sabka uh, vikas has been executed in every way and that is the sense of confidence you know you've done the heat of heat on your rivals in tamil nadu uh, you said that stalin's dmk is an anti hindu party so when i say something i mean it because i feel it also uh, not not south divide encouraging that is that is that is that what you say they have always called bharatiya janata party two things nirmala ji thank you very much once again for giving us this exclusive very special interview like every year after the budget uh through our news 18 network uh, through cnbc cnbc awaaz uh, cnn news 18 uh, you will be able to reach every nook and corner of the country and investors are glued into moneycontrol.com tracking every twist and turn of the budget thank you so much my first question uh, a somewhat obvious question uh no sops no populist measures even in 2019 interim budget the government had announced some sops you know like tax rebates there were some announcements for the farmers but none this time uh, seems like a very confident prime minister going into 2024 elections you've never looked more relaxed to me before uh, what was going on in your mind while drafting this well thank you for having me uh, after the budget like every year it's a great opportunity to talk to your viewers and also for others who are watching uh this program more with the keenness to know about the indian economy yes the budget yesterday did not have any sops announced um we treated it like a true vote on account an interim budget before an election and also an interim budget which is being presented with the clear understanding that the several programs which were launched with empowerment of citizens in mind over the last 10 years are reaching the ground and the beneficiaries are already on their own speaking about it the power of word of mouth is very strong so when a beneficiary gets truly the benefit and without any middleman playing a role in it they really understand that the intent of the government is what they've said is what is getting executed so i place a lot of trust in the word of mouth which has helped in schemes like ujwala pm awas yojana pm mudra yojana swanidhi yojana all of which have benefited the small households small uh, people who want to do their business and who don't have money to give for collateral no properties to give so this government has actually because of the vision with which prime minister is committed to serve this country is actually serving the common people in letter and spirit and that is recognized by the people themselves it's not as if you are saying and you are showing target numbers you are showing achievement numbers no the people in the ground are saying about it yes. i've got it and so is my neighbor so is the neighbor of that household and so on so and that is why i have used an expression and i mean it when i said it that this is secularism in action this is where we have not shown any difference between members belonging to this community or that community this religion or that religion or somebody's relative and not relative no difference the project reaches the ground for everybody who deserves to get it and if they are eligible they get it irrespective of who they are and therefore in every way the principle of empowerment the sabka saath sabka vishwas sabka uh, vikas has been executed in every way and that is the sense of confidence that the blessings of the people are not just at the time when we gave promises but the blessings are even now coming in abundantly to say yes you've kept up your word it is what the prime minister has also been talking about the forecasts as he calls it That's right. you know the poor women farmers youth so i That's think right. that is the cornerstone of this part of this speech 
Nirmalaji, you've steered the economy in difficult times. You know, if I look at your last, uh, last five years, uh, there's been the pandemic. Right now, two wars are going on. Uh, even then, we are projected to grow at 7.3%. Now, if I were to look at the non nominal, nominal GDP, which has grown uh, only 10.5%, uh, consider an inflation of 4, 4.5%, uh, do you think that 7% itself would be challenging? I mean, do you think it is realistic for us to grow on those lines? The chief economic advisor has also commented um, in his uh, preface, he's elaborated on how 7% uh, is not difficult to achieve. Um, Globally also, the various organizations which look at economies of all countries, like IMF for instance, has also enhanced their own assessment. So upgrading our growth estimates is not just singularly our business. People are seeing that fundamentally a lot of activities are happening. The robustness of the economy has not slackened anywhere. It has maintained its, you know, the, the, the buoyancy with which things are happening, not just revenue collection when I'm talking of buoyancy. So there is reason to believe, yes, it is possible. And the deflator, not just the inflation, but the deflator mm. itself uh, is constantly, meaning we are looking at controlling inflation, the other factors fall in place, so the deflator itself then plays a role and therefore... Uh, we are confident that on the one hand we'll be able to manage inflation and on the other to keep the robustness in growth so that it is sustained growth. We have made every effort to look at both growth driving elements and inclusivity driving elements so that nobody is left out from this growth process, both to contribute yes. and to gain from. One of the big ideas this budget, which struck to everyone as a big idea, uh, has been the announcement of a corpus of one lakh crore, uh, you know, to provide interest-free or low-interest sort of loans for research and innovation. Can you elaborate a little bit on this? How will this work? Uh, will there be a separate sort of uh, entity managing this? How will it, how will it go forward? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I, first of all, would bring in a bit of a context to, to this. It's not as if we are doing it now for the first time. Earlier, too, there were several funds within different departments like the science and technology. Um, uh, they had a CSIR, its own. Funds were all over the place. You had them doing supportive activities for innovation, each from their own side. Two years ago, I remember announcing the National Research Foundation, which brought together all these uh, you know, thinly spread resources to one uh, pool, and from there, each of the departments would claim whatever they would want to uh, fund in terms of innovation supportive activities. But what we've now done is they may remain so, but the government would now bring in a kind of a institution or a vehicle which can take this one lakh crore which will be given to them next few years in total uh, as an interest-free corpus amount. Using that they can then identify innovation-related exercises which are happening in uh, private sector and fund them. I may give this interest-free 50-year loan to the corpus, but the managers of that fund will then decide to whom at what cost should they give it. The cost may vary depending on the risk factors and the judgment of the professionals who will manage it. But it's certainly a fund from where private innovation will be supported. You know, one, one more question on the stress that is being seen in the rural economy. You know, your higher allocation outlay to Manrega also in, is an indication, betrays, uh, you know, the stress on rural economy. Uh, you know, if you look at the results of FMCG companies, consumer durable companies, uh, you know, even if you look at the Nielsen data, it shows that the rural volume growth has underperformed urban volume growth for almost seven quarters now in a row. So what is your prognosis of rural demand and how do you think we will deal with this going forward? I'm not sure if I'll be able to describe how I view uh, what is happening in the rural areas. Let us recognize that there is a lot of 
shift in the way employment is panning out. Let us recognize that migration is now looking at redefining itself in a way. Many people who went back to their villages with some skills acquired are wondering if they can continue being there and utilizing and benefiting from the skills that they've acquired. Uh, industries too today are allowing a lot of work from home and many who are avoiding traveling are also staying back. So the shift will have to be recognized. But equally that's not to say people are staying back home without work or staying back and working from there with large companies being established everywhere else. So there is a transition happening undoubtedly. Yes. Second, there's also this little savings which is coming through, which we are seeing from the various fixed deposits which are growing as different from small savings. Yes. You're also seeing some middle class looking at savings through the stock markets, DMAT accounts and so on. So the indicators with which we are looking at the rural economy may vary and there are very many newer indicators which we may not want to miss out on. Yes, I agree FMCG uh, market will also tell us that uh, consumable, durable consumables are not being consumed as much as before. Yes. But, well, I take that as one indicator, but equally the kind of activities which are now happening in the rural areas because of better connectivity, because of other uh, digitization are also yet to be measured, I would think. In your budget speech, you were very appreciative of, you know, income tax payers. You, in fact, the number of income tax, uh, you know, people paying income tax has gone up, collections are up 2.4 times. Uh, you, were, you were quite appreciative. In fact, I, I thought you just stopped short of sort of giving them something back because, you know, it was a vote on account. Uh, my question is that, you know, salaried people are paying 30% today, whereas corporates pay 22% tax. In the longer term, directionally... Corporates meaning as an entity, yes, the company. Yes, ent that's right. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying in the longer term, directionally, do you think this would, you would align this in some way or the other? I'm, I'm talking about the longer term. Well, the direct taxation reforms are a steady job in the pipeline and some results come out and more work is happening. So direct taxation is something on which we, one, ease of uh, the taxpayers uh, facilitation which has to be improved and also one of the things happened yesterday, one of yes. the uh, serving the customer better business That's in the taxation regime happened yesterday, but more work can always be done. Yes, so so the so salary can be more hopeful in the coming days in your July budget. I'm not budget. saying anything now. <laughs> no, no, I know that. I mean directionally over the long term. You know, another question, current question, uh, RBI has imposed restrictions on the operations of uh, Paytm Payments Bank. Uh, I don't, you know, want to go into the details, but uh, just a question is, what is your message to the fintech industry? Uh, is there more than meets the eye in this case, or are we just, are we going to be cautious when it comes to the uh, fintech sector? No, I wouldn't want to com uh, comment on any one particular com company, okay. but fintech is an area in which all of us are very enthusiastic. India has contributed a lot in this sector. India's contribution in this sector has been globally recognized. Today, if people are looking at solutions, fintech solutions, they are looking to India. Our youth have contributed a lot and built capacities for themselves. This is an area which we'll certainly like to work with and encourage. I'm not commenting on sure, any one company. Any that's, that's heartening to know for the fintech industry. Thanks for the message. Uh, you have been tightening things around. Would you think that the RBI should loosen now? Well, RBI does take its own call, but I, I will appreciate the RBI for working together with the stakeholders. And uh, they take a call, keep, I'm sure they take a call that keeping growth in mind, they've been steady, I suppose. They'll continue to be steady is my expectation and hope. Uh, few quick political questions. I'm aware of the time. Thank you for answering all our business and economic questions uh, at great length. Uh, we are seeing a different side of Nirmala Sitaraman. You know, in the last few weeks, 
uh, you, you've also been seen as an aggressive politician. Uh, you know, you've turned the heat, of ri heat on your rivals in Tamil Nadu. Uh, you said that Stalin's DMK is an anti-Hindu party and that they were forbidding the live telecast of the Ram Mandir Pran Pratishthan ceremony. Uh, what do you have to say to that? 100%. I, I have not said a loose word. I did mean what I say and I do truly believe that repeatedly they attack on Hindus in Tamil Nadu uh, in layers which are seen and in layers which are not seen have been felt for a long time. I speak very many times about Tamil Nadu with lived experience yes. and therefore I don't talk too soon nor do I speak too uh, indiscreetly. So when I say something, I mean it because I feel it also. I do corroborate with data, with actual ground activities, and then only comment. Unfortunately, if that is the politics of a state party, uh, which has had a lot of uh, uh, ideological support extended to separatist politicians of years gone by. Yes. Whether they support it even today, I do not know, but there are periodic voices which come out which are very separatist in tone and tenor. My grief is a national party like the Congress party has been decimated in Tamil Nadu and today, till today, they are not a position to win an election, even a couple of seats on their own, without being in alliance with one of these parties. BJP is, of course, a beginner there. It's been there since the uh, Jansang days, and it's gaining strength. We'll continue to work with the people. But the grief that I want to express is a national party like Congress Party also joins that anti-Hindu voice does not condemn the anti-Hindu voice of the party DMK. And even worse, goes in support of such voices which come from DMK. And today, not just in Tamil Nadu, a Congress party member in the Lok Sabha today, meaning he's a sitting Lok Sabha member, and a brother of a chief a deputy chief minister in Karnataka, also speaks in separatist voice. So anti-Hindu is one, and to Hindu activity is another, which also is happening in Karnataka, incidentally. Congress party in Tamil Nadu supports these kind of anti-Hindu or anti-separatist voices. And today that is a spirit with which Congress also is aligning, which is what I find utterly shocking. Is there an attempt to paint the Bharti Janta Party as a North Indian party? And you know this uh, North, North South divide, encouraging that. Is that, is that, is that what you say? They've always called Bharti Janta Party two things. It is a Brahmin Baniya party. Yes. It's a Hindi party. <clears throat> Today, the kind of support BJP receives in South India disproves all this. And in, I don't want to name individuals and say, oh, he or she belongs to this caste. We promoted this caste and therefore, more than BJP, I can challenge today, is there any one party in India which has worked for the betterment of tribals in India, which has worked for the betterment of the Dalit scheduled castes in India, which has recalled some of the best iconic leaders coming from those communities but attaining national stature, whether it is Dr. B. R. Ambedkar, whether it is uh, Guruji and considered like God himself, Birsa Munda, whether it is the uh, sons of the Shabzade, Sikh gurus, who gave their lives in their teenage for the sake of our country. So in any one of these, I want to ask, is there any one party in this country which has not, which has as much served as the BJP? So what is Hindi party? 
when, when Prime Minister of India is talking about all languages, he quotes Thiruvalluvar. Yes. He talk, uh, quotes from Purana Nuru. Every given opportunity, he takes the languages even to the UN. So, Tamil Nadu's politics, speaking of these kind of things, has happily kept the Hindi-speaking parts of the country, even if they are in alliance with them, away from the separatist rhetoric. So you think, oh, we are in alliance with that party, they cannot do any wrong. Yes. But they've been speaking all these separatists earlier. They are speaking anti-Hindu earlier, only because of the language gap. Just as they didn't want to learn Hindi, many of the North Indians didn't want to learn Tamil. So there's never been an understanding, a comprehensive, complete understanding of what's developed in Tamil Nadu. So are you hopeful that the BJP will do better this time in South India? I mean, uh, how many seats do you see them getting out of 131 seats? It's difficult to talk about number of seats, but I'm sure but the Andhra efforts which are being made by Tamil Nadu BJP unit. So you're likely to open your account in these states like Tamil Nadu, Andhra they'll Pradesh? They'll certainly work for the people uh, and hope to have their Kerala. blessings. Of Tamil Nadu, you have a... You have no, a, whether it's Kerala, whether it's Tamil Nadu, Lots of work is happening, and people are responding as well. Are you likely to contest the elections? I don't think. No. It's my party's decision. Okay. Uh, one last question on 2024. Uh, you know, what is your assessment? How many seats are, do you think that the BJP is likely I'm not sure I'll, again, yeah. uh, speculate on the number of seats. Better than last time? Much better than last I time? I think people will see the truth and commitment and dedication with which the Honorable Prime Minister has been working. They are blessing him. They are seeing his earnestness. They are seeing how non-stop he puts the people of India and the nation first among everything else. So I'm confident. The opposition has constantly been crying themselves hoarse about the use of intelligence agencies, you know, so whether it is Kejriwal or Mamta Banerjee's leaders uh, in West Bengal or Heman Soren uh, more recently, uh, you know, they complain that there is harassment by central investigative agencies. Uh, and if, uh, you know, the leaders jump onto the other side and join the BJP, then they are let go scot-free. Uh, what do you have to say? My last question. Now, first of all, many of the cases in which the CBI or the Enforcement Directorate or the Income Tax pursue cases cannot come to the level of asking for custodial or asking for interrogation or arrest can happen overnight. You will be surprised in many of these cases. The cases were originally filed during UPA times. Many of these cases belong to that era. You know the Indian system, the level and the time consumed for each stage to mature and to reach a stage where summons are being served. It consumes a lot of time. Many of these are from that era case. So it's not as if we've done it. One, second, a survey or a search happens. Tell me if they've come empty-handed. Roomfuls of cash. Equally, when we are talking about common man adopting to technology, doing digital payment, you have people sitting with tons of currency notes in their homes. Nowadays, everything is videographed. I can't sit here and say, I found so much cash in your house without a proof. The video shows in the bathroom, in the bedroom, in lockers, tons of cash being kept. What explains that? So it's very well to use that as a whip to hit at the ruling party to say you're using the Enforcement Directorate or CBI. These are professional agencies. They take huge time to make their cases compact and ready because everything is now monitored by the court once the charge sheet is filed. Yes. And you have to submit the documents to the court. You can't just go there and say, I found this, I found that. Records prove it. So, era is changing. People don't like to have corrupt leaders. So when the enforcement directorate go and knock at the doors and come out with such pictures, 
Common people are seeing it. You may cry hoarse, as you said, saying it is being politically used. I'm sorry. It is something which was case from your era. You filed a case against your own ally. There are partners in crime. And then there are partners and enemies also. Yes. Nilwaji, thank you so much for answering all our questions. You, are, you, you answer economic questions and political questions with equal felicity and passion. It's always such a pleasure to speak to you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Rahul.